on World News Tonight. The Djokovic debacle. Australia strips the tennis star of his visa yet again. The country teetering between contrasting decisions as fans and citizens express mixed views on the controversial events that unfolded. Tonight, the latest updates on this visa saga. Biden blocked. The Supreme Court hands the U.S. president a rejection on his latest vaccine mandate plans. However, the jab campaign is not all lost, with separate federal measures being decided. Pandemic protests. Teachers in France revolt against the government for its confusing COVID rules, many demanding the current leadership to go firm or go home as schools struggle to reopen. Mr. Mischief. An endangered tiger hub, though being barely a month old, takes on his adventurous spirit with a stroll. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off tonight's broadcast with the latest debate of the world number one tennis champ. Australia has revoked tennis star Novak Djokovic's visa for a second time in a row over his right to remain in the country unvaccinated. For more on this, let's cross over to other than a World News special correspondent Timothy Phillip who joins us now from Melbourne in Australia. Yes, Shina. The decision made by Immigration Minister Alex Hawke means Djokovic now faces being deported. However, the 34-year-old Serbian can still launch another legal challenge to remain in the country. The men's tennis number one was scheduled to play in the Australian Open, which begins on Monday. The move also means Djokovic likely faces a three-year ban on obtaining a new Australian visa. There was also an enormous backlash from some Australians who have lived under long and strict COVID lockdowns that Djokovic had been allowed in despite being unvaccinated. He was detained, spent hours at immigration control at the airport, and then spent days at an immigration hotel. Days later, his visa was reinstated by a judge who ordered his release, ruling that border officials ignored correct procedure when he arrived. But on Friday evening in Melbourne, Mr. Hawke cancelled Djokovic's visa under separate powers in Australia's Migration Act. The Act allows him to deport anyone he deems a potential risk to the health, safety or good order of the Australian community. However, Djokovic can still appeal this. Back to you, Shannon. All right, thank you. That was Other Than a World News Special Correspondent Timothy Phillip reporting from Melbourne in Australia. The royal family removed Prince Andrew's military rings and royal patronages and said he will no longer be known as His Royal Highness as the son of Queen Elizabeth fights a U.S. lawsuit in which he is accused of sex abuse. In a stunning rebuke by the royal family, Britain's Prince Andrew has been stripped of his military titles and forced to relinquish all ties with his royal charities. The moves came one day after Andrew's lawyers failed to persuade a U.S. judge to dismiss a civil lawsuit claiming he sexually abused a minor some two decades ago. Andrew will also no longer use the title of His Royal Highness and will defend his case as a private citizen, according to a statement from Buckingham Palace Thursday. On Wednesday, a U.S. judge declined to dismiss a civil lawsuit in which Virginia Dufresne accuses Andrew of sexually abusing her when she was 17, while she was allegedly being trafficked for sexual purposes by late financier Jeffrey Epstein. Andrew has denied Dufresne's accusations, which include allegedly forcing her to have sex at a London home of former Epstein associate Ghislaine Maxwell, also a friend of Andrew's. A royal source said the decision over Andrew came after wide discussions among the royal family and that his military affiliations and patronages would be redistributed to other family members. Earlier, an open letter to the Queen, signed by more than 150 veterans calling for Andrew to have his military titles taken away and, if necessary, to be dishonorably discharged, was published by the anti-monarchy group Republic. Andrew was forced to step down from public duties in 2019, with Buckingham Palace increasingly distancing itself from the prince, declining to comment and referring all questions to his lawyers. The conviction of Maxwell last month on sex trafficking for Epstein and other charges, together with his own case, had left his reputation in the British media in tatters. 
Andrew's case could go to trial by the fall if no settlement is reached beforehand. Poland's foreign minister said that Europe was at risk of plunging into war as Russia said it was not yet giving up on diplomacy, but that military experts were preparing options in case tensions over Ukraine could not be diffused. It seems that the risk of war in the OEC area is now greater than ever before in the last 30 years. At a security meeting of 57 nations in Vienna on Thursday, Poland's foreign minister said Europe was closer to war than any time in the last three decades, as Russia said diplomatic efforts to defuse tensions over Ukraine were hitting a dead end. After the meeting, the U.S. ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe said the West should prepare for a possible escalation in tensions with Moscow, adding, quote, the drumbeat of war is sounding loud. Meanwhile, Russian snipers took part in military exercises near the Ukrainian border on Thursday, following tank drills the day prior. Russia denies planning to invade Ukraine, but says it needs guarantees from the West for its own security, including barring Ukraine from joining NATO and rolling back decades of alliance expansion in Europe, demands the U.S. has called non-starters. In an interview on Russian television, the country's deputy foreign minister said diplomacy must be given a chance, but that Russian military specialists were providing options to President Vladimir Putin in case the situation worsened. Later on Thursday, U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said at a White House press briefing that the U.S. was ready to respond to any Russian aggression. Russia has said it will decide on its next moves after this week's talks, but the pessimism from Russian officials cast grave doubt on the chances of a diplomatic breakthrough at one of the most fraught moments in East-West relations since the Cold War. North Korea was quick to react to the United States' latest sanctions on the North. The regime says it's going to have to take tougher action if Washington keeps an aggressive attitude towards the North. North Korea has warned that Pyongyang will be forced into a, quote, stronger and certain reaction if Washington continues to take a confrontational stance against the regime. In a statement issued by the North State Media on Friday, a spokesperson for the foreign ministry said the North's recent development of a new type of weapon was a part of efforts to modernize its national defense capability. A reiteration of the North's long stance that it will not give up on its, quote, right to self-defense. But, experts note, it's a burden for both Pyongyang and Washington to continue in the current situation amid such tension, with the U.S. already having confrontational relations with China and Russia. The North's number one task still is improving people's livelihoods amid economic difficulties due to pandemic border closure. Pyongyang also toned down the warning slightly by issuing the statement from a foreign ministry spokesperson. South Korea's Unification Ministry on Friday once again urged the North to respond to Seoul's efforts to create peace on the Korean Peninsula through a dialogue while pledging to keep close tabs on Pyongyang. The North's warning on Friday came just a day after Washington slapped sanctions on six North Koreans for their roles in procuring equipment and technology for the regime's missile programs. The Biden administration's first to specifically target the North's ballistic missile tests. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield also proposed U.N. sanctions following the North's six ballistic missile launches since September 2021. North Korea test-fired what it claims to be a hypersonic missile on Tuesday, the second such a launch in less than a week. Britain's domestic intelligence services has warned lawmakers that a London-based lawmaker is trying to covertly interfere in U.K. politics on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. Britain's spy service MI5 warned Parliament that the Chinese government has deployed a woman to exert improper influence over its members. MI5 on Thursday sent out an alert with a picture of the woman named Christine Lee, alleging she has interfered in UK politics on behalf of the Chinese Communist Party. An MI5 spokesperson, Lindsay Hoyle, said they've discovered Lee has, quote, facilitated financial donations to serving and aspiring parliamentarians on behalf of foreign nationals based in Hong Kong and China. Britain's interior minister told reporters that Lee's behavior wasn't currently unlawful. 
but added the alert was necessary to warn lawmakers about her attempts to influence them. Lee is the founder of a law firm with offices in London and Birmingham, and one of its stated purposes online was to advise the Chinese embassy in Britain, according to a government official. Requests for comment have been denied or left unanswered. The Chinese embassy in London said in a statement that China does not interfere in the internal affairs of other countries, adding, quote, We firmly oppose the trick of smearing and intimidation against the Chinese community in the UK. An opposition Labour Party lawmaker, Barry Gardiner, said he had received hundreds of thousands of pounds in donations from Lee and that he had been liaising with intelligence services about her. Britain's relations with China have deteriorated in recent years over issues including Hong Kong and the treatment of Muslim Uyghurs in Xinjiang. Last year, MI5 urged Britain to treat the threat of spying from Russia, China and Iran as seriously as terrorism. It's going to a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more world news. Welcome back to World News Tonight. We now move on to the updates of the COVID crisis around the globe. The U.S. Supreme Court blocked President Joe Biden's COVID-19 vaccination or testing mandate for large businesses while endorsing a separate federal vaccine requirement for healthcare facilities. The U.S. Supreme Court on Thursday blocked an effort by the Biden administration that would have expanded a COVID-19 vaccine mandate to large employers nationwide, undermining a major element of the president's plan to combat the pandemic. The requirement would have applied to some 80 million employees. But in a 6-3 decision, the justices ruled the mandate exceeded a federal health and safety officer's authority. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki, while disappointed by the Supreme Court's decision, said the White House will press on. Uh, we'll be calling on and will continue to call on businesses to immediately join those, those who have already stepped up, including one-third of Fortune 100 companies uh, to institute vaccination requirements to protect their workers, cons customers, and communities. The unsigned ruling said that the rule issued by the Occupational Safety and Health Administration was not an ordinary use of federal power. The court wrote, quote, it is instead a significant encroachment on the lives and health of a vast number of employees. The three liberal justices on the court dissented. Justice Stephen Breyer wrote for the minority that the decision, quote, stymies the federal government's ability to counter the unparalleled threat that COVID-19 poses to our nation's workers. But the court did approve a separate mandate requiring health workers at federally funded facilities to be vaccinated. That mandate covers an estimated 10.3 million workers at 76,000 health care facilities. In that decision, Conservatives Brett Kavanaugh and Chief Justice John Roberts sided with the court's liberals in a 5-4 ruling. Both cases tested presidential powers to address a monumental public health crisis that already has killed more than 845,000 Americans. The United States leads the world in COVID-19 deaths and infections. Huge numbers of French teachers went on strike with the biggest teachers' union, saying half of the primary schools were closed as staff demand clarity for the government on coronavirus measures. In what was said to be the largest walkout by French teachers in decades, marchers filled the streets across the country Thursday to protest the government's changing COVID rules in the classroom. With the majority of the nation's teachers in the streets, union officials said the one-day strike forced about half of the country's elementary schools to shut their doors. Teachers are furious about what they say are the government's unworkable and confusing COVID rules, which have changed twice in just the last week. The latest change came on Monday when the government announced that students exposed to a classmate with the virus wouldn't immediately be sent home or be required to be tested at a pharmacy. Late Thursday, French Education Minister Jean-Michel Blanquer met with union officials to hear their demands for clear rules and more protections, such as extra masks and rapid tests. We understand what's on the table and the fact that there is fatigue from the challenges of the health crisis. And tonight we had a good discussion and talked about moving forward with concrete measures. President Macron, who faces re-election in the spring, has prided himself on keeping schools open during the pandemic. But the country is now at the epicenter of Europe's current fight against COVID-19. New daily infections topped 360,000 this week driven by the highly contagious Omicron variant. 
Africa has officially stated that it too is joining the race to acquire the highly effective COVID pill Paxlovid. The drug make, made by Pfizer has been selling at rapid rates due to its resistance against the infamous Omicron variant, unlike Merck's pill which has shown disappointing test results against the strain. Africa's top public health body is in talks with Pfizer about securing supplies of its COVID-19 treatment pill for the continent. Dr. John Nkengasong, director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, said there were really close discussions with Pfizer over Paxlovid, which the drug maker says is 90% effective in preventing hospitalizations and deaths. Because if uh, we have uh, another variant that emerged, like the Omicron, and just imagine if Omicron was that transmissible and also very severe, and it was overwhelming our hospital system. The only way to relieve that would be if we have the drugs like the Paxlovy, where people can take that drug and stay home and, and, and get relief. And that way the, the burden and the, all the constraints on the health system will be limited. Governments around the world are scrambling to buy Paxlovid, which Pfizer says data suggests retains its effectiveness against the Omicron variant. Another treatment from Merck has faced setbacks after disappointing trial data. And Kengasong said obtaining the drugs was one of three key approaches to tackling the pandemic, alongside scaling up vaccines and testing. The continent has officially recorded 10 million cases, though patchy testing means the real number is likely to be much higher. Wealthy countries like the US and Britain have secured deals to buy the treatment pills, but there are concerns low-income countries will miss out, as was the case in the race for vaccines. To mitigate the issue, Pfizer has put a licensing agreement in place with International Public Health Group Medicine's patent pool. That will allow generic manufacturers to supply versions of the Paxlovid treatment to 95 low- and middle-income countries. We have some good news for you. To fight a flood of fake pills in Nigeria, startups are deploying barcodes and apps so that consumers can authenticate their pharmaceuticals. At a biofilm facility in Lagos, Chief Executive Femishira Mekon shows how you can check these pharmaceuticals are the real deal. Via a barcode and a phone, you can authenticate the drugs. And that's important in Nigeria where the prevalence of fake medicines is higher than the global average of 10%. In 2009, biofilm had the anti-diabetic prescription drug glucophage counterfeited in the market, causing a decline in revenue. To fight a flood of fake pills, Nigeria's National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and Control has partnered with startups to create stickers with unique codes. Manufacturers and distributors attach them to boxes and sachets of drugs. Consumers use apps to scan and confirm authenticity. One such app has been developed by Check It Technologies. When it gets to five, you win a hundred naira instantly. Founder Dari Adumade says incentives are used to encourage the consumer. 4.8 billion US dollars worth of fake drugs have been seized by NAFDAQ in the past three years, says his director of investigation and enforcement, Kinsley Joffo. But he said the use of apps is boosting confidence in the pharmaceuticals sector. He added that 200 containers of counterfeit medicine are currently at ports, shadowed for destruction, and that the major sources of the fake drugs were China and India. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Super Bowl 56 kicks off in Los Angeles in less than a month and officials say that they will be functioning at full capacity. However, apart from entertaining a full stadium, all other COVID regulations will be in place. Following up on the groundbreaking pig heart transplant that took place in Maryland a few days back, the recipient shows positive signs of recovery. While his family and friends are overjoyed at the outcome, doctors too are quite optimistic about the current state of David Bennett. A new report says North Korean hackers stole at least 400 million US dollars worth of cryptocurrencies in 2021. A report found 20% of the funds stolen by North Korea last year was Bitcoin. The majority at 58% was Ethereum. Tesla aims to start initial production of its Cybertruck by the end of the first quarter of 2023, pushing back its plans to begin production late this year.
China Evergrande Group secured a crucial approval from onshore bondholders to delay payments on one of its bonds as other cash-strapped developers also scrambled to negotiate new terms with creditors to avoid defaults. China Evergrande won approval to delay payments on one of its onshore bonds on Thursday. And that may have just helped the company avoid a messy outcome. Evergrande wanted more time for bond coupon and redemption payments to avoid a technical default which would have complicated the company's politically sensitive restructuring. In a statement, Hengda, an arm of Evergrande, said more than 72% of those who voted approved the proposal to delay payments on the $157 million bond. Evergrande is weighed down by $300 billion in liabilities, making it the world's most indebted real estate firm. It has so far met payments on the onshore bonds which make up most of its debt, However, it has defaulted on some offshore bonds. Evergrande's woes are shared by other Chinese developers who have struggled with a liquidity squeeze. Many face defaults and credit rating downgrades due to curbs on borrowing. Shanghai-based Shimao Group is talking to creditors about extending its payments according to documents. The World Bank has warned any severe downturn in the sector would be felt throughout China's economy. It said the country's developers' combined onshore and offshore liabilities total almost 30% of the country's GDP. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again on Monday with another edition of World News. If you couldn't catch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always rewatch on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash English. And we are leaving you tonight with a look at one of the most endangered tiger cubs having mischievous fun by taking a look outside its home. Thank you for joining us again. Have a good night.